Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. My name is Manuel and today I will walk you through how I put together the very first prototype of my CubeSat in the lead up to the test flight. Almost all of this hardware was fabricated by PCBWay who are also sponsoring today's video. If you're new here, I'm developing an open source and relatively affordable CubeSat. And this is SN1, the very first prototype, which I sent to the stratosphere on a high altitude balloon on July 6. And just to be clear, this is not space ready hardware yet. This is a very early and basic prototype. My long term goal is to fly a low Earth orbit demo mission by 2035, so this is definitely a long haul project. If you want to take a closer look at what you have so far, you'll find all the links to the structure, the electronics designs and the software I used for the balloon flight in the description. Also, before we get started, we now finally have a Discord server for this project. So if you're interested in joining, you'll also find the link in the description. Thanks to Tim and James for helping me with setting it up. I know we're all eager to get to the flight postmortem, but I think it makes sense to talk about things chronologically because a lot of the problems I had during integration ended up having an impact on the flight. So let's maybe start with a quick demo of SN1. Since the flight I have removed the side panels and the backup video system and also swapped out the batteries, but everything else is as we recovered it, which is also why this nylon string is still attached. As we have discussed in a previous video, this build has two MCU carry boards with RP2040s on the C plus side. MCU1 with LoRa and GNSS function boards on the bottom and MCU2 with a Blues Wireless Note Card LTE board on the top. On the C- side there is the CM5 carry board with two Raspberry Pi Mark III cameras. One of them faces towards the X plus side and the other one is downward looking. The software running on these boards is written in Python and MicroPython respectively and it's quite rough around the edges. I basically just threw it together for the test flight. I'm not a good programmer by any means and just know a bit of Python, so looking to the future, software is one of the areas that I hope will become more of a community effort. To turn the system on, you need to pull the RBF and deploy jumpers. The RBF jumper lets a system-wide enable line be pulled high as soon as there is power and the deploy jumper turns the battery disconnects off and lets set power flow, as we see here by the LEDs lighting up. Now, as long as the deploy jumper is applied, the system is inert, which is a precursor to future deployment switches. Also, at some point we will need a more elaborate power sequencing scheme, but for the moment we only need a way to turn the thing on or off. Now let me tell you what's supposed to happen when the jumpers are pulled. I'm not saying that's what happened during the test flight, but it's what's supposed to happen. MCU1 and MCU2 both try to get a GPS lock. Looking at MCU1 first, once it has a lock and gets back coordinates, it starts transmitting telemetry over LoRa to my two ground stations. One at the launch site and one on my friend Jules' balcony. The ground stations are just Raspberry Pis with Uputronics LoRa hats on them. I got these with HopeRF modules for both 868 and 433 MHz. Right now I'm using the 868 ones, but in future flights I would like to compare the range between the two frequencies. The ground stations basically act as relays and upload the received telemetry to a Firebase database. What you see here is some data from a test run prior to the launch. Every two and a half minutes or so we get a new timestamp document that contains what has been received by the ground station as well as some metadata about the transmission like RSSI and signal to noise ratio. Quick sidebar here, the two and a half minutes transmit interval is because there are some regulations about transmitting on LoRa. It's different all over the world, but in Europe, when, where I'm based, you can transmit with a 1% duty cycle, so 36 seconds out of every hour. How long your transmission takes to send depends on its size and bytes and a bunch of other parameters. I went with the LoRa config that should give the longest range in theory and I'll put it up here. So my script calculates the airtime it will take to send a given telemetry package and adjusts the transmit interval accordingly with some margin to stay on the safe side. If you always transmit the same length of message, you could just use one of these LoRa airtime calculators and set the fixed interval. Now again, all of this is the way it was supposed to work, but unfortunately I ran into a really annoying bug with LoRa telemetry, which we'll talk about in a bit. So leaving this tangent now and going back to the boot sequence, in addition to transmitting telemetry over LoRa, MCU1 also saves a log file locally. There is a FRAM chip on the board, but I haven't gotten it to work yet, so it's just saved in flash memory. Oh, and also if it doesn't get a timestamp from the GNSS module, um, MCU1 uses the onboard DS3231 real-time clock as a time source. 
Let's look at MCU2 next. In addition to GNSS, the Blue's wireless note card on here looks for a cellular network and I have it configured so that it sends its location to NoteTab if it detects motion. NoteTab is the management and database backend for note card devices and it's pretty well designed. I then have a small cloud function script set up that just sends new data to the same Firebase database as we saw before. If MCU2 doesn't get a GNSS lock, it uses the coordinates of the nearest cell tower, which is what we see here. And MCU2 also stores a log file locally. These log files are mainly there in case we don't get any data back during the flight, but manage to recover the payload and extract the data afterwards. Which turned out to be a very good idea, because none of the LoRa and LTE stuff ended up working, but that's a topic for the flight postmortem episode. Moving on to the CM5 carrier board down here, there are a few more things happening. So on boot, this starts the Flight Ops Python script as a systemd service. This script will first check if there's a Wi-Fi connection, which would mean that it's either here in my home Wi-Fi or at the launch site. If there is a Wi-Fi connection, it will check the launch and countdown times on Firebase to see which phase of the flight we're in. So it's either in ground, countdown, flight or loss of signal, and depending on this, it will behave a little differently. Most significantly, it will take stills at a high rate during the flight as opposed to before and after it. And if it's in the countdown phase, it will initiate a UDP video stream or Wi-Fi from the X Plus facing camera, so we can ingest it into OBS and stream the liftoff from the payload's point of view. Again, this is what was supposed to happen, but no plan survives contact with reality, as they say. The CM5 also logs some data like its clock speed, connection quality, CPU temp and so on and also uploads it to Firebase as long as there is a Wi-Fi connection in addition to logging locally. There are two INA260 ICs on the board with which we should be able to log supply voltage and current draw but they only worked sporadically from the start and at some point they stopped working entirely. I suspect some I2C trouble here but this still needs to be investigated. One neat thing I'm pretty happy with concerning the CM5 flight software is this config file which gives you somewhat fine-grained control over the cameras and there's also a simulation mode with which you can force the flight phase for testing. So this script is far from perfect and nothing to write home about really, but it's functional for the time being. If you want to explore it a bit further, the link is also in the description. That's it for the demo, so let's talk about integrating the prototype now. I think the full step-by-step -step build deserves its own separate video, but what I would like to mention today are some of the things that worked well and some of the challenges I faced when putting everything together. I am grouping these topics by subsystem, so if there's a section that you are more interested in, feel free to skip to these timestamps. EPS Bay and Rails Assembling the basic structure worked like a charm. There are just a few quality of life improvements that I would like to implement in the next revision, but the overall goal of being able to put this together quickly and swap rail sizes out without much hassle is achieved. I went with a 1.5U size because of the local high altitude balloon payload weight limitation, which is 2 kilograms, but you could just swap these rails out for a 1, 2 or 3 unit length. It remains to be seen if this rail design with the bolt holes going through the corners will be certifiable for flight, but for the prototyping we are doing at the moment, it's great. What I think contributes a lot to all of this fitting together so neatly is the fact that PCBWay makes really nice aluminum and plastic parts. Dimensions are well within the tolerances I selected at checkout and the type 2 anodization of the 6061 parts seems flawless. As you can see here, there are also some FDM printed parts. These are mainly preliminary designs that I didn't get machined yet. I printed those myself, but if you don't have access to a printer, you can also get them printed by PCBWay from a range of materials. Or you can get machined plastic parts, like these battery bay inserts I got made from low outgassing PEEK. The side panels need a redesign. A problem related to the structure is the side panel assembly. It's one of these things that look decent in CAD, but as soon as you actually have to put one together in the real world, it's really annoying. So there are a number of problems with these, but since they're in for redesign anyways, I will not go into too much detail right now. The things that work pretty well are the zero profile interconnects and these braces, as well as the overall fit, but the way they attach to the structure needs to change and they also need to gain a better understanding of how to attach the solar cells. I used this Atom Adhesives AA duct conductive epoxy, which I picked because the awesome Frontierset project uses it. But my problem was that I needed to use some brass standoffs because of some botch wires I added, and this tiny surface turned out to be not remotely enough to hold the cells. On recovery, most of the cells had fallen off. So all in all, the side panels are conceptually okay, but they need a redesign for functionality. 
CN covers. These cheese plate style boards I used on iDrend are just a preliminary design. They did the trick for the test flight in terms of offering a place to mount cameras and antennas, but getting them on there was cumbersome and also due to a clearance issue they stuck out way too far. So these will also need a redesign. One feature I'd definitely want to keep is this array of pilot holes. I drilled some of those out so the SMA connectors would fit and that worked pretty well. Oh and while we are at this end of the satellite, these holes and pockets on the C ends of the rails are for future deployment switches. It just turned out that they are also ideal to mount the nylon strings for use on a high altitude balloon. The minimal EPS did its job. I have talked a bit about the problems with this board in one of the previous episodes to which I will link here. So while it's not in its final form yet, it mostly did its job for the test flight. The battery disconnect switches work as they should and also short circuit protection is solid. Under voltage protection was disabled as we discussed in the previous video. One thing that needs to change are these through hole NTC thermistors for sensing battery temperature. They are cumbersome, tend to short out and don't make good contact with the batteries. What I want to use in the future are single pixel infrared sensors and one per battery. But that will be something for the full fat EPS, not the minimal variant. The buck module worked better than expected. It's set up to provide 3.3 volts and 5 volts, which it did at up to 5 amps each after I added a bigger cap on the 3.3 volt rail. I wasn't able to measure output ripple and noise because I don't own an oscilloscope yet. If you think that should change, I put the link to my Patreon in the description. For testing I used this little PCB chick that Bud Robotics designed a while ago. This is the very first community contribution to the Build a CubeSat project, which makes me kind of happy. So thanks to them for making this. The buck module uses about 100 milliamps while idle, which is way too much quiescent current, and it also gets quite hot. So while it does work, it will still need some looking into. The solar charging module, on the other hand, is a very different story. So let's talk about that next. Charging doesn't work. I have assembled three of these charging modules so far. The one I tested on a breadboard last year worked fine, but unfortunately I got them mixed up and the one I ended up soldering onto the flight EPS doesn't. By the time I realized that, I didn't have enough time to swap the module out and I didn't see any other way to fix this. The third module also doesn't work, which tells me that this is not just a fluke. So, as people have pointed out back then already, these micromodules are kind of hard to debug and generally too expensive. I'm not going to spend more time trying to get this to work, but instead it's time to get started on a proper charging module. This is definitely something that could be a community effort and I'm looking forward to talking more about this on Discord. I just realized that this video is already getting a bit long, so let's wrap it up here for today and I'll upload the second part in a week. Thanks a bunch to PCBWay for supporting this project and thank you for watching. Let me know if you liked this episode and I'll see you in the next one.